our Palm Sunday passage comes to us from John chapter 12, verse 12 to 19. Can I ask that we turn our Bibles to the Gospel of John? We'll pick up from verse 12, and we will read up until verse 19. As usual, we'll be reading from the ESV. I'll give us a short moment for us to to find our ways there, and afterwards, I'll read it for us, and I want to welcome us to follow along with our eyes. Once again, the Gospel of John, chapter 12, picking up from verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remember that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. We're picking up next day. Uh, Verse 12 gives us the cue. Next day. Next day from what? Well, from last week's sermon, where Jesus was lavishly anointed by Mary in her act of worship of anointing Jesus with the perfume, a costly perfume. Next day, we see that a crowd has gathered, those who have come to the feast. To put things into perspective, it's kind of nice. It would have been Palm Sunday for them too. But for us, it's Palm Sunday because of what they've done, right? Because they honored Jesus with palm branches. But it was still the beginning of Passion Week for them. It would have been a Sunday. And at the end of this week would have been the Passover. Passover for them, for us, Easter Sunday, this side of the cross. And so the city of Jerusalem would have been bustling with people from all over the place. Um, the, the first century Jewish historian, Josephus, he uh, described one such Passover, not this one in uh, John chapter 12, but one of the Passovers of having over 2.7 million people gathered in the city of Jerusalem, many of them pilgrims, making that trip to the holy city so that they can partake in the Passover. So, like I said, I don't give you that number of 2.7 million people to say that here in this passage there are 2.7 million people in the crowd, but rather to to paint a picture for us to to be able to see there are a lot of people. A commentator notes that in this specific passage, we're probably looking at Jesus on the road that leads to Jerusalem from Bethany, where he was, where he was anointed, and he is being greeted by the pilgrims probably from the region of Galilee. So Galileans who were familiar with the ministry of Jesus and they've heard about what he has done to Lazarus by raising him up from the dead. They've now gathered. They've already come to Jerusalem, but because they heard Jesus is coming, they come out of the city, the crowd comes out of the city and they welcome him. And how do they welcome him? Let me reread for you verse 13. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And of this statement, we're going to take a look at two things. The first thing is, what is the significance of palm branches? And then we're going to be looking at the significance of the statement, which starts with Hosanna. First, the palm branches. First, it's noted by many commentators that there will have been an abundance of palm branches around the vicinity of Jerusalem, more specifically, date palm branches, dates. 
But many of you guys are probably thinking, well, there's nothing in the Old Testament which prescribes for the use of palm branches during the Passover. And you'd be right, because nothing of that sort is written. So why are people using it to greet Jesus with it? Well, palm branches had become a sort of a, a national symbol for the liberation of Israel. Because about two centuries earlier, before Jesus came into Jerusalem of John chapter 12's event, there was a man named Simon Maccabee of the, a, a famous Jewish family, the Maccabees. He had driven out the Syrians from the Jerusalem citadel. And after he did that, driving out the foreign rule, he was welcomed with songs and celebrated with palm branches. And so in a way, palm branches had become synonymous with this nationalistic liberation. And this mixed in with the hope of a Messiah that was already embedded in the nation of Israel. So the palm branch, it represents the welcoming of someone who would liberate the nation of Israel. And so with that explanation of what the palm branch uh, signified, we take a look at that exclamation, which is Hosanna. And uh, many of you guys know Hosanna means save us, literally meaning give salvation now. And it was a very familiar phrase for the Jews because this phrase comes from Psalm 118, from a group of songs, psalms called the Hallel which is Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. And they would have recited these Psalms, Psalm 113 to Psalm 118, during every festival, reciting them and singing them. And so the word and the meaning of Hosanna was not unfamiliar to the Jews. But it's not just the word Hosanna, bring salvation now that is being said, but they're saying a phrase after that, which is, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord which is also found in Psalm 118. But what is significant is that this phrase, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, was used as a greeting for the pilgrims who would make their way to Jerusalem. So they would say, blessed are you, you who are coming into Jerusalem, and this blessing in the name of the Lord. I bless you in the name of the Lord. But that's not how it's being used here in John chapter 12, verse 13. Rather, a phrase is added. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And so what that changes in this statement is it no longer becomes a blessing statement that is done in the name of the Lord, but it's actually saying, blessed is he, you, king of Israel, who comes bearing the name of the Lord. I hope that wasn't too confusing. So let me say it once more. It was originally used to say, I bless you, you pilgrim coming into Jerusalem. And that blessing, I do it in the name of the Lord. But now how it's used on Jesus is saying, blessed are you, O king of Israel, who comes bearing the name of the Lord. The difference is they are identifying this man to be the Messiah, to be the king that everyone has in Israel has been waiting for, the, the source of hope of someone who will bring salvation now. Great. They're finally getting it. My goodness, things were looking kind of hopeless last 11 chapters. You know, some were getting it when Jesus pointed, hey, I'm equal to the Father. I'm God. I'm Messiah. People were saying he's crazy. But there must have been some secret conference we don't know about because it seems like the crowds, they get it. And they're saying, he's the Messiah. He's the King of Israel. Blessed is he who bears the name of the Lord. Well, we know there's more to this story. Something is a little off, isn't it? Because we know what happens on Friday. Their Friday. We call it Good Friday. On their Friday, this chant of Hosanna, blessed, he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, it's going to quickly turn to crucify him, kill him. Because as soon as they found out that this Messiah is not the one that we had in mind, we don't want him. 
Because baked into these palm branches, baked into this, save us now, King of Israel, they had thoughts, they had an idea. Our Messiah would give us political freedom. Our Messiah is gonna give us political autonomy. They're gonna drive out the Romans as Simon Maccabee drove out the Syrians. But Jesus, he didn't do any of that. They wanted a king like David who would go to war on behalf of Israel. But this king, he had other things in mind. He was proclaiming himself to be a different type of king. What did Jesus have in mind? What was Jesus proclaiming of himself in entering into Jerusalem? The next two verses, verse 14 and 15, give us some insight. Let me read those two verses for us. Picking up from verse 14, and Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Stop right there. The gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, also known as the synoptic gospels, they have a little bit more detail of how Jesus gets his hands on this donkey. Namely, Jesus arranged for it, a divine arrangement. I'll give you an example from Matthew 21, 1 through 3. Matthew 21, 1 through 3. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. And you know what happens? That's exactly what happens. The two disciples, they go, they, they see the donkey and the colt, they untie him, bring him. The owner, the supposed owner says, hey, what are you doing? They say, the Lord needs it. They say, okay. Divine arrangement. Jesus knew what he was doing. He knew that he was going to ride into Jerusalem in a donkey. Why? Because he was going to fulfill the prophecy that had been prophesied concerning the Messiah back in Zechariah 9. Nine. And the heart of that verse is this. Do not be afraid, O Jerusalem. Your king comes, not riding on a war horse to declare war on his enemies, but he comes humbly on a donkey, proclaiming peace. And for us to see even more, I want us to see all of Zechariah 9, verse 9 through 11. Let me read that for us because we're going to see even more of what kind of king Jesus is proclaiming himself to be. So read with me Zechariah 9, 9 through 11. This is the passage. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. And so we get some images here. Once again, he's not coming in to declare war, but he's coming in to declare peace. We are also noted and reminded that Jesus, he's not just the king of Israel, but he is the king of all. His rule will be from nation to nation, from the river, pretty much meaning one end, to the ends of the earth. He is the Lord. Do not forget the God that is coming in. He is the Lord. There is none beside him. There are no other gods, even lowercase gods. We can make idols and gods of things, of material things, or of even people. But really, 
There are no other gods. He is the only one. And he, the king of the nations, he is riding in. And lastly, he speaks peace. And this peace will be had through the covenant of his blood. You see, Jesus is not riding into Jerusalem to be proclaimed as king only of Israel, but he is riding in so that you and I will be able to see, so that we will be able to behold that he is the king of all the nations. Because Jesus is not riding in to Jerusalem to take care of an Israelite problem, but he's riding into Jerusalem to take care of humanity's problem, namely our problem with sin. Jesus is not riding into Jerusalem to be glorified by men through palm branches and half-hearted chants of Hosanna. No, he's riding in rather to glorify the Father by submitting himself to the Father's will. And what is the Father's will? The will of the Father is that his son enter Jerusalem where the temple is where there had been numerous, countless sacrifices of bull and goats, sacrifices which all pointed to a need of a greater and a more perfect sacrifice. And Jesus here at that temple will be offered as the perfect and the final sacrifice, the guiltless, pure Lamb of God, Jesus himself, the Son of God, will be slain and bear the guilt of the world and bring peace between God and man. He had much more in mind than the liberation of one nation. He had in mind the liberation of humanity from sin so that we could be restored to God. Ultimately, he is entering Jerusalem because Jerusalem is on the way to the cross. And it's only through the cross that peace could be spoken to the nations, to the world, the peace which was achieved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Three implications from this passage for us. And as we go through these implications, we'll also um, enlarge, kind of look at the rest of our passage. Number one, and it's this. He is your king. Behold your king. And you guys know the word behold. It gets at seeing. It gets at gazing upon. It gets at discerning, looking. Behold your king. And he's not only king when we recognize him to be, as we see in this passage, even when they don't recognize him, he is still king. And he's not just king. For Christians, he is the Lord. He is the king of the universe. I know at church we say a lot of things like, for those who call Jesus their Lord and Savior, for those who call him your king, and then we list the benefits that we have through Christ, right? But if you're sitting here and even though you don't call Jesus your king, guess what? doesn't change the fact that he still is king, that he is king above all kings, and he is the Lord of lords. Everything happens according to what this king dictates. Everything happens through the counsel of his perfect will. There's not a single activity on earth that happens apart from the king's sovereignty. He is the Lord of the universe. His rule extends from nation to nation in every heart in between. You see, Jesus wasn't sold on the crowd's empty praise of Hosanna. He knew that these empty praise of come save us and palm branches of be our liberator, political liberator. He wasn't sold on that. He knew that this kind of address would make the leaders of the the Jewish nation that it would make them jealous, and this jealousy would ultimately lead to the betrayal of Jesus and lead him to the cross. The cross wasn't done to Jesus. Jesus knew what he was doing. He was entering Jerusalem on his own accord through the perfect obedience to the Father. Jesus obeyed unto the cross. 
Because if he didn't, we would all be dead in our sins and our rebellion towards God. We see um, that this implication leads us to our second implication, which is this. Behold, your king loves you with a perfect love. He is a king who knows better than you. Like mentioned before, his wisdom is higher than ours. And therefore, his love is perfect. Though the crowds did not know it, though his own disciples had no idea the implications of him riding in on a donkey until hindsight, after he was glorified, after his death and resurrection, the the disciples, they would know it then. Even though people did not understand, he still acts. Because what he does is not dependent upon our understanding of what he's about to do nor is it dependent on what we think would be best. No, God knows. Our king knows what is best, and he does it. The crowd, like I said, they're going to abandon him in a week's time because Jesus doesn't fulfill their Messiah expectations. But Jesus knew that they had a bigger problem on their hands than political freedom, bigger glory than political autonomy. Jesus, our king, had more in store for his disciples, for his believers, more than what any of the kings in Israel's history could offer them. Jesus knew that we, humanity, had a problem with sin, that we could never obey God perfectly. And though the crowd proclaimed him as king, really at the heart of it, they were kings telling Jesus, hey, you better fulfill these needs. We had a rebellion problem. And it is that sin that prevented us right relationship with God. Therefore, he acts even when we don't understand. He goes, he enters to Jerusalem to offer his blood as the peace that will be had through the blood of his covenant. And he still does this, he still does this today. A lot of the times we live our lives and we act according to what we think is right, what we think is fitting. Sometimes we don't understand. But know that for the saint, for those who call Jesus their Lord and Savior, he is still acting on behalf of your best benefit so that you would behold him because that is the best thing for his children. And so we proclaim to him, Lord, do what is absolutely necessary so that we would behold you as king and not place ourselves as our own king. You know, if we were there on that day, I believe that we could have been so easily swept along with the crowds, picking up palm branches, looking, taking cues from the crowd. Oh, yeah, I heard that there's a, a Messiah. I heard that there's a king that's, that's arrived. And getting caught up in the excitement of that moment, proclaiming him as king. But a fickle faith. And I can also see me, five days later, picking up stones, because he didn't fit my image of a king who would benefit me in the ways that I want. Knowing this, our good shepherd laid down his life because it was for that very fact that we love to enthrone ourselves as king. That is the heart of rebellion. That is pride against our God. Knowing this, Jesus does what is absolutely necessary for his people. He will ride into Jerusalem humble, present himself as the Lamb of God, and he will give his life for us. The third and the last implication that we derive from our passage today is to behold our king together. Where am I getting that together? 
I'm getting it from a rather ironic statement that the Pharisees will utter at the end of our passage. We see that the Pharisees, they're not really beholding the king. They're too busy looking at how they're losing their political power. And they will say this. In verse 19, they look at one another and they say, so the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, this is hyperbole. This is exaggeration. It's kind of like when we say, oh, goodness, the whole world loves him. Do we mean everyone in the world? No. And that's what the Pharisees are doing. They're exaggerating the truth. But even in the midst of their exaggeration, there is a gold nugget of truth. And we've seen this kind of irony before, people not knowing what they're saying, but they're actually saying the truth. The world will go after him. The world in the sense that the gospel writer John likes to use the word world. When the gospel writer John says the world, the cosmos, he's not talking about everyone in all nations, every heart, every mouth, every mind of every tribe. No. But he is saying from every nation, without racial distinction, those who are in rebellion towards God, they will now be able to go and follow him. So he's not saying every heart, but yes, from every nation, from every tribe and tongue, there, those who are in rebellion and lost in their sin, there will be those who will go after him. From every corner of the earth, they will go after him. And isn't that true? Look around this room right now. Not everyone's Korean. Not everyone's Korean American. Not everyone is just this, just that. Just, we're, a lot of nations are represented here today. You, the church, are living evidence that the world indeed went after him. Because of what Christ has done, we can now desire to go after God, something that was impossible. But through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through his calling, through his grace and mercy, now we can go after the true desire of our hearts. We can be restored to God. He is the king who has given himself for us, and today we're going to have a special opportunity to behold him together. And that's going to happen through the partaking of the Lord's Supper. And like I said earlier today, right after the sermon, we're going to partake in communion. And through this act, not only do we remember what our Lord Jesus Christ has done in giving his body and his blood for us, but we are proclaiming with all of our action, with all of our body and spirit, the sentiments of Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Through this communion, we're saying his death was mine and his resurrection is now mine as well. I've been crucified with him. I don't live anymore, but I live through Jesus Christ, through faith. And we're gonna celebrate that together as a body. But before we enter into communion, I do want to warn us. There's a stern warning for us in 1 Corinthians 11. First and foremost, communion is for the body of Christ. It is for the family who calls Jesus their Lord and Savior. If you are here and you have yet to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your only hope from sin, and if you have not declared him to be your Lord and King, we ask, we as the church, we ask that you would refrain from taking the elements. Just kindly pass the elements to the next person as they are passed on to you, for this is a family meal. But also, the saints, 
Christian, this stern warning is extended to us as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says this, For those who eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Now, that's a little bit scary. I don't want to die. Perfection is not what is being desired from this passage. It's not saying you need to be perfect if you want to partake in the Lord's Supper. Rather, it is saying, I want the posturing of your hearts. We sin countlessly and endlessly, don't we? All the, the words that go unsaid but we harbor in our minds, all the thoughts that people don't see. But it's not those thoughts and the words that are hidden that define us, but really what we choose to do with them, the posturing of our hearts, which says, nope, that doesn't belong in a son. Nope, that doesn't belong in a daughter. Nope, I will not say those things. Nope, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna cherish those things as my treasure. That's what defines you and me. And that's what this supper is beckoning, a posturing that says, I am the Lord's. Anything that is not of him, I'm gonna drop it. So let us also examine our own hearts. Are there areas in our lives which we made peace with sin, saying, that's okay, or give me time to figure this out? Or is there a posturing of our hearts that says, Lord, I hate it when I sin, but I grieve the Holy Spirit again and again. But save me, Lord, give me once again your renewing, your sanctifying power so that I would hate the things that you hate and that I will pursue the things that you love. That's the posturing that we want to give on to him. That is how our palm branches and our hosannas will be fitting to what is in the inside. I'm gonna ask uh, the praise team to come up. I'm gonna ask the pianist to come up because I'm gonna give us a time to examine our hearts, to reposture our hearts, the positioning of our hearts before God for communion and to be able to say, Lord, you are my only hope. Lord, I need you. Let us pray and reposture ourselves before him. Father, who can partake in this celebration? You know our wayward hearts. But Lord, we grasp the blood of Jesus Christ yet once again. It is his blood and his blood only that makes us white as snow, as pure as gold. He is our only hope. Lord, also see the reposturing of our hearts before you. We are letting go 
we're dethroning ourselves as king and we are acknowledging you as the true king. You alone are welcomed in my heart. As we prayed before, we are at your beck and call. We don't want to tell you what to do or what should be done in our lives. But Lord, we want to take cues from what you are doing and what you want us to be doing in our lives. Father, help your children, help your sons and your daughters to let go of the things that are harming us, to let go of the bitterness that is robbing us of joy, to let go of the uncertainties and the anxieties that plague our lives. And Lord, you know that it is easier prayed with our words than executed in our lives. And in those moments, I pray that you would hold us fast, you would stabilize our weakened knees, our feeble hands, so that we could stand before you. And Lord, as we partake of the bread, which symbolizes your body and the cup, which we will remember the blood that was poured out for your people, I ask that this act would sanctify your people as we see and behold together who you are. Be glorified in this communion. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask, ask the ushers to come up now as they will be helping to, to pass the elements. And as they come up, I want to read for us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 and 24. For I received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The ushers will come around. Please, take the bread. And as you wait for the rest of the body, remember him the body that was broken for you. I believe the body has received the bread. Let us hold up the bread together. And before we partake of it, we remember that this is your body. Let us repeat to one another 
let us proclaim together. Through his body, we have received peace. Through his body, we have received peace. Once again, through his body, we have received peace. Let us partake of it together. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In the same way, the ushers will come around passing the cup. We ask that you receive it. And when all the body has received it, we will partake of it together. The blood of Christ. I believe that the body has received the cup. In the same way, we'll raise up our glasses and repeat after me. Through your blood, we have been saved. Through your blood, we have been saved. Once again, through your blood, we have been saved. Let us partake of his blood. Pray with me, body of Christ. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we will proclaim the Lord's death until you come back. May your body be found proclaiming and beholding you rightly until you come back. Lord Jesus, we are grateful, we are thankful, that you entered Jerusalem that day on Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago with more in mind than what we could have conjured up from our good ideas. Thank you that you were obedient to the Father, not shunning the cross, but welcoming the Father's will. And we thank you that you gave your life for us we celebrate you and you only in this place. 
in not only this community here at NHM, but as different churches around this city, around the globe, see you as we enter into Passion Week, we ask, Lord God, that you would take more of our lives, that you would take more spheres, that you would be king over all of them. May you be exalted through the worship, through the adoration of the lips of your people from nation to nation, from river to the ends of the earth. For you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you and you alone are worthy of this praise. We thank you and we pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen. in response we're going to sing that that bridge one more time isn't he worthy so would you join me in singing and declaring the worth of our lord and savior jesus christ isn't he worthy isn't he worthy isn't he worthy forever worthy the lamb who was slain isn't he worthy isn't he worthy, forever worthy, the Lamb who was slain? Would you stand with me? Isn't he worthy? Isn't he worthy, forever worthy, the Lamb who was slain? Isn't he? Isn't he worthy? Isn't he worthy, forever worthy, the Lamb who was slain, we give you, we give you the glory. 
Oh, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy when we recognize you to be worthy. You are also worthy when we forget about this truth. You are worthy in season, every season of our lives. And now, when the song fades and we are found on our Monday mornings, our Tuesday afternoons, our Wednesday evenings, may your people be found uttering this truth. You are worthy. You are worthy that this would be our nightly tune, that no matter what hath come throughout the days, passed by through the afternoons, that in the evening, our songs to you would be, you are still worthy. You are still king. You are forever king. Take my life. Be Lord over it. May your people be found uttering this anthem throughout their days. May it be done for your glory. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. May it be done so. Give glory to your Lord. He is worthy. He is worthy.